Okay. So picking up what we left off last night on chapter seven. Um, this chapter again deals with all the agency relationships that we have in real estate transactions. Um, and we left off last night on page 130. We talked about those three different classes of agency relationships. Which one do we say that real estate brokers most often work in? Special, Special agency. agency. Right. So how do we create these agency relationships as real estate brokers? Well, the first two are going to be the most common. These are your bread and butter. When you look at this list, you should look at those and go, all right, those are those are the ones. Those are the ones I want. Folks, that's how you get paid, those first two. Now, the other ones might get you paid a little bit as well. But those first two, that's your bread and butter right there. A listing agreement. So tell me what you think a listing agreement might be. Who is doing what? The buyer. No, the seller. The seller is coming to you. To list their property. To list their property. So who is the seller hiring? The firm. The firm. That, keep that in mind. So a listing agreement is an agreement between the seller and the firm that hires the firm to represent them in the sale of their property. That's what a listing agreement is. A buyer agency agreement is the exact same thing except on the other side of the, the transaction. Right? It is a written agreement between a buyer and a firm for that firm to represent a buyer. Now, I'm going to back up and I'm going to point out a couple differences here before we really get into these. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to hit that button. Okay. This one up here, the listing agreement. Go ahead and jot down in your notes, even though we're going to talk about it more in a later chapter must be in writing always. Listing agreements must always be in writing. Can you stick a sign in front of somebody's house that says for sale before you have a written listing agreement? No. No. You need this agreement in writing. Now, notice I didn't lump them together. I didn't say Listing agreements, buyer agency agreements must be in writing always. What do you think that means about buyer agency agreements? They do not have to be in writing always. They can be oral agreements for a period of time. We can have oral buyer agency agreements for a limited period of time. Anytime, and this is another hint before we get in later chapters. Anytime, and I want you to listen to me here, because you'll see test questions about this. And instead of trying to memorize it 50 different ways, of you, you must do this by this point in time. And you must disclose this by this point in time. And this is the latest point in time you can do this. <laughs> Anytime there's something that you can do for a limited amount of time, or there's a deadline by which you must do it, relating to some kind of a document, that time is going to be presentation of an offer. That last possible time to do something is almost always going to be presentation of an offer. So before we even get to the rules about buyer agency, what do you think the rule is about how long your buyer agency agreement can be oral and not written? Until it's time to present an offer, and then what do you have to do? Put it in writing. That is the rule about buyer agency agreement. So right out of the gate, you know that, that listing agreements have to be what? In writing. Buyer agency agreements can be oral until what happens? Until we make an offer. And then we have to put it in writing. Okay? Another way we can create an agency relationship is something called a dual agency contract. Dual agency is when a firm, because remember it's the firm who represents the clients, correct? Mm -hmm. Is when a firm represents both the buyer and the seller in the same transaction. Now, of course, firms are going to represent buyers and sellers. But the key here is they're representing the buyer and the seller in the same transaction. In other words, 
we represent the seller of 123 Main Street, and we also represent the person buying 123 Main Street. Hold your questions about that. We're going to talk a lot about that thing. But for right now, I just want to define what dual agency is. It is when a firm, not a broker, right? A firm represents both the buyer and the seller at the same time in the same transaction. That would create an agency relationship. Another way we can create an agency relationship is with a property management agreement or contract. What's that? When what, Who is hiring who? Who would they be hiring to manage their property? A firm. The owner is hiring a firm. Notice that trend, right? An owner of a piece of property is hiring a firm to manage their property. Now look at this one here. In-house brokerage employment contract. Who are the brokers? Oh. Us, right? right? Who's going to employ these brokers? The firm. The firm. So what do you think this means? What does this bullet point mean? This is an agreement between the, what two parties? The brokers and the firm. Brokers and firms. But it's on the list of things that create agency relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So what that must mean is that the brokers actually have an agency relationship with their Firm. firm. That is very true. We said the firms represent the clients, right? Well, then who do the brokers represent? The firm. The firm. The firm works in the best interest of the client. So who do the brokers work in the best interest of? The firm. The firm. Because the only way that the firm can work in the best interest of the clients is if the broker works in the best interest of the firm, which thereby works in the best interest of the client. It's really important to remember it all flows through the firm. Always. Okay? And then this last one is something we really don't want to do. Just put no beside that in your book. It's a bad idea. Here's what implied conduct means. It means we have acted like we have the authority to do something to the public. They think we are this thing that we really are not. And here's what the law says about that. If you have the license to do that work, and you act to the public like you have the authority to do it, you just got all the responsibility of it, even if you really weren't that person. Let me give you a real world example. Let's say I have a client who I have a listing agreement with. And we have their house for sale. Now this example worked a lot better three years ago when you couldn't sell things, but just bear with me right now. Let's say we can't sell their house. It's a real dog. I can't sell it. We have been in the market for five months, six months, got no offer. They come to me and they say, well, what do you think about leasing it? And I say, look, the leasing market's really hot right now. I think you'd get a tenant. But one thing I do not do is property management. I'm not a property manager. I will put it out for lease for you because I can put it in the MLS. And you'll probably get tenants. And I'll just charge you a flat fee for doing it. Can you do that? Can you just charge them a flat fee for putting it in the MLS as a rental property? but not managing the property. Sure, right? Absolutely you can. So you put it in the MLS. Person calls. They want to see the property. Who goes and shows them the property? Yeah. Probably me, right? Because it's whose number is going to be on the MLS? Yours. Mine. So they call me. I go show them the property. They end up filling out an application and leasing the property. They move in. A week after they move in, they don't have hot water. They got to call somebody, right? Now they got the lease, and the lease has got the landlord's name and phone number on it. But whose sign was in the front yard? Mine. Whose number did they call the first time they went to go look at the property? Mine. So they pick up the phone and they call who? Me. Now, when I answer the phone, what should be the first thing I tell them? I am not the property manager. You calling the wrong person. Call the landlord because they're managing the property for you. Don't call me anymore. I'm out. But here's what we do because we like to be nice. The client, the owner lives in California somewhere and we know that, right? And we had this problem before, three months before when the house was on the market. The pilot light blew out 
in the water heater, and we know it's just one button to press on the front of the thing. It's in the garage, and by the way, my, my sign's still in the front yard. I need to go pick it up anyway. So instead of me telling them, I'm not the property manager, what I say to them is, i got to run by there anyway to grab my sign. I'll see what I can do about it. And I go over there, and I light the pilot light on the thing. Folks, what did I just become? I just became the property manager, a.k.a. the landlord. Same thing. And I a lot, same thing. Because here's the thing. What is this perspective of the tenant? Something's broke. I called Travis and he did what? Fixed it. Fixed it. So he must be the property manager. And the state of North Carolina says, I are the property manager at that point in time. And guess what I are also doing? Working for free. Because <laughs> I don't have a property manager agreement with that seller or owner that says they're going to pay me anything for that service. Don't do that. If you don't have the authority to do it, say I don't. Announce it. Say clearly. It's not me. Call somebody else. Okay? Everybody got what implied agency is? It's it's like accidental agency. You don't want to do that. Okay? So, how do we, again, go about it, creating these documents or creating these agreements? We want to have express agreements. Express agreements are one where the terms are clearly laid out. A good example of an express agreement is a written agreement. Now, these agreements don't have to be written in order to be considered express. Remember I said you could have oral buyer agency, right? That's still a buyer agency agreement. But you've expressed the terms of it orally. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But what kind of express agreement would we rather have? Written. 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 We don't ever want these implied agreements. One of the most important points in, in the real world of real estate is this last bullet point that's on the screen. Compensation does not determine agency. Here's what that means. It doesn't matter who's paying me in a transaction. I'm hired, my firm is hired, to represent a client. Sometimes the person paying me is different than that client. And that's all right. It doesn't matter. Who do you think pays most of the commissions in a real estate transaction in most cases? The buyer or the seller? The seller. Who pays the buyer's agent? The seller. The seller does. Right? Ultimately, it's the seller's money that's going to. And so that's what we mean by compensation doesn't dictate our agency. They're not related. It doesn't matter where the money's coming from. Okay? So how do we end these agency relationships? Well, the best way to end one is fulfilling the purpose for them. What would be the purpose of a buyer agency agreement? Helping them purchase a home. What would be the purpose of a listing agreement? Sell that particular house. So the best way to terminate those agreements would be to accomplish that task. Get paid. Close. The second bullet point is an important one that you're going to be tested on. What does it say? A good way to end an agency relationship is for it to do what? Expire. Expire. Underline that word. Star it. Highlight it. Number one rule of all agency agreements in the state of North Carolina is that they must do what? Expire. They cannot be open-ended. You can't write a listing agreement that says, I list it until it sells. It has to have an expiration date. Now, can that expiration date be 99 years from now? Absolutely. That's a date, right? As long as it has a date for expiration. All agency agreements must have an expiration date. So how do um, brokers go about determining that length of time? How do brokers go about determining the length of time for a listing agreement by our agency agreement? Um, the correct answer according to the book and according to the way that if you want to teach by the law is it's individually negotiable in every case. The real world answer is most of your listings are going to be for six months and most of your buyer agency agreements are going to be for three months. And the reason is that's what's most common in the marketplace. But obviously you, on a case-by-case -case basis, you may adjust that. Somebody may list their property with you and not 100% trust you. When you're brand new and you don't have a lot of experience, right? they may be reluctant to give you a six-month listing on something. 
They may say, all right, well, I'll list it with you for a month, and we'll see how it goes from there. So you may have to do that. So after that month, it expires, it expires, and then you have to create a new one if you want to continue. That is correct. That is correct. Or they can do what? Find another, Find another company. Find another firm. Because that agreement has expired. Now, I want you to keep in mind something about these agency agreements, because somehow this gets past everybody. These are contracts, folks. How many people are bound in, in a contract most of the time? Just one side of the deal or both sides of the deal? Okay. Both sides of the deal. So here's what I hear people say a lot of times. My agent sucks, man. I'm going to fire that company. How can you fire somebody that you have contractually obligated yourself to? The answer is you can't. And guess what? There are plenty of clients that you'll want to fire. Guess what? You can. It's a contract. There's nothing up here that says one way to terminate an agency relationship is one side gets sick of working with the other side. I don't see it. Do you? But now I do see this one. What do you think mutual agreement means? You both sick of working with each other. And if I want to get rid of you as a client, you want to get rid of me as a broker and my firm, we can absolutely agree to eliminate that agreement. I've said that before to a client. I don't like you, and you don't like me. It's time for us to go our separate ways. Don't you agree? When they stop listening to me, that's when it's time for me to go. Because at the end of the day, what did they hire you for? Expertise. Expertise. Advice. Right? The rest of it is just taking pictures and putting stuff on a computer server somewhere and coming up with catchy marketing tools. There's a, a thousand different people that can do that for you. But they hire you for your market expertise. That's what you that's what they should be hiring you for, right? And I remind my clients of that sometimes. I'll say, all right. If you're the expert, why did you hire me? I've never had one that had a good answer to that. Now, does it make it uncomfortable? Oh, yeah. But you know what? One or two things happens at the end of that conversation. They either start taking my advice, or we agree to go our separate ways. Because one of the most powerful words, and none of this is on the test, by the way. This is, not, this is just a tangent something you should learn early in your career, the most powerful word for you as far as building your business is not going to be yes. Everybody tell you that's what you want to do. You want to get to a yes. The most powerful word for you in building your business is going to be no. It's going to be to tell, look somebody square in the face and say, no, I won't list it for that. I just sat here for 30 minutes and explained to you why the market value of your property is $225,000. If you can't understand why I won't list it for 275, then we can't work together. Why would I do that? Because here's what you're gonna get in the real world, and if you go work for a broker in charge other than me, here's what they're gonna tell you. Oh, you take that listing. You take that listing because you need that experience. You take that listing because you need to get your sign out there and you get your name out there and get exposure. And you're right, you are gonna get your name out there. You're going to get your sign out in front of that house and everybody's going to see it. And everybody's going to see it sit there so long that the weeds grow up this tall around the base of it. And everybody's going to know you as the agent who can't sell a house. And is any of that going to be your fault? Yes. Whose fault? We, yeah, because you did what? Because you took the listing. Rather than telling them up front from the jump, you're being unrealistic. And I can't work miracles. If I could, I'd be in a different line of work. If I could turn 225 into 275, I would not be selling houses, folks. There are a lot better things I can do with that kind of a skill. It's, it's just true. And sometimes you need to remind your clients of that. Right? Because if, you don't, if they don't find out from you, they will find out from the market. And here's the thing. Whoever takes that listing at 275 is not going to be the one who ultimately sells it. There is a listing agent in Chapel Hill, her name is Shala Reslani. 
And if you don't ever learn anything else from another agent in this business, learn from Shaw. She is the nastiest, crudest, meanest. There's just no redeeming qualities there, honestly. And she'll tell you that. She will flat out tell you that. Her clients hate her. And she does more business than anybody else in Chapel Hill. And she almost never lists a property that hasn't already been listed before. Because you know what she does? She goes to every one of these ones that expires. And she knocks on the front door. And she said, are you tired of screwing around? And you want to really sell your house now? That's what she does. And she takes that listing that was on the market for two seventy five, dollars and she puts it on the market at two thirty five, dollars where it ought to be, and miraculously it sells in a week. And so you know why her clients have hate her go back to her time and time again? Because they know she'll get it done. Right? So you've got to be that person that has the willpower to say no when you know it's the right thing to say. Right? I'm off the soapbox now. Right? All right. Other ways we can terminate these agency relationships? We can have a breach by a party. One of the two parties doesn't do what they're supposed to do. Operation of law, that just means court. court. A court, a judge, can always terminate any contract. If the property is destroyed, obviously if you've got a listing agreement on a home or any piece of property, and that property is destroyed, then your listing agreement goes with that. And death or incapacity of either party. Now this one's one you've got to be careful with, especially for a test. Death or incapacity of either party. I think it's real important to go back and define who the parties are to these agreements. Who are the parties in a listing agreement? The firm. The firm and the client. The client, the seller, right? Listing agreement, seller and firm. Death or incapacity of either party. Well, death of the seller makes sense, right? Who has to die on the firm side of things for that to matter? The whole company. If the listing broker dies, does the listing go away? No. No, because the listing is not with that broker, right? Mm -hmm. The listing is with the firm. So the only way we have death of the firm would be if the firm goes out of business. Oh, All right. I may be jumping. Yeah. But it's a destruction. Yep. Um, land, what about land? Land, you're right, cannot be destroyed. <laughs> So what we mean in this sense with the word destruction is the improvements on the property are destroyed. It's a good question. Or condemnation of the property, which means put the government has taken it. That would also end the listing agreement. Okay. So let's talk about some different types of agency relationships. Let's talk about the way it used to be first. Single agency. Now up here it says the broker slash firm exclusively represents either the buyer or the seller in a transaction. The broker slash firm exclusively represents either the buyer or the seller in a transaction. We also call this exclusive agency. Single agency and exclusive agency are the same thing. Remember, if you exclusively date someone, how many people are you dating? One. Just one. Now, in the good old days, whether they were or not, I don't know. I was not here for them. Prior to buyer agency existing, single agency was the only thing that existed. Because buyers didn't have representation. So every agent worked for who? The seller. the seller. Here's how the real estate model that we use today has evolved. I feel like it's good to give you some context here, right? If you back up 40 years ago, if you came to Raleigh and you wanted to buy a piece of real estate, there were a couple ways you could find it. Probably three ways. You could drive around, look for signs. You could pick up the newspaper or maybe a Homes and Land magazine would be the second way. Or you could walk into a real estate firm and somebody sitting at the front desk would pull out this big binder. That's actually how they did it. And put it in front of you 
of things that were for sale. Now, if you walked into a real estate firm and they pulled out that big binder, and by the way, that's the way most people did it, whose listings were they showing you? Their firm's listings. Because remember, everybody represents who? I mean, the seller. Everybody represents the seller. So when they see you come in, when you go to a car lot to buy a car, do they try to sell you one that's at the car lot across the street, or do they try to sell you the ones that are on their lot? On their lot. They want to try to sell you the ones on their lot. Same thing in real estate 40 years ago. When you walked into that real estate firm, they pulled out this book of listings, and they tried to sell you something that they had listed. Right? So, let's say you were that agent sitting at the front counter when they walked in that day. And you sat down and you asked them what they were looking for, and you looked at the book, and you found houses to show them, and you took them out, and you showed them those houses, and they didn't like any of them. Now, you got a friend who works for the competing company across town, and you call your friend and you say, God, I got this client, and they're looking for blah, 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 blah. And your friend says, I got one listed just like that. Why don't you send them to me? And you as a broker in that position go, what do I send them to you for? <laughs> How am I going to get paid that way? Right? Does that make sense for everybody? Would it be kind of important to get paid after you've done all this work with this person? Mm -hmm. And so what you would say to that agent at that point in time is, you know, why don't I do this? Let me just show them the listing. And if they like it, I'll bring you an offer on it, and you can just split the commission with me. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. But now, who do both of those agents represent? The seller. The seller. Even though one of them worked for a completely different firm, they both represent that seller. Here's the problem with that, though. If you go ask that buyer in a dark room by themselves that this agent who's been driving them around their car for three weeks and taking them to show these things and she was so nice she even called another place and found us a house that we were looking for, who is she working for? What would their answer be? Working for me. Right? Wouldn't that be what the buyer would say? They'd be like, oh, she's working for me. In reality, who was that agent working for? The seller. Is it dangerous when the person who you think is working for you is actually working against you in a transaction? Very. Because think of it this way. Imagine if you've been going to this attorney for three weeks because you are accused of murdering somebody. And the first time you go in there, your attorney, you've got to tell them everything, right? You sit down and you say, look, I did kill her, but... That's how you start the first conversation. And three weeks later, you realize that that person's actually the prosecutor in the case. That would sort of be a problem, wouldn't it? It's the same thing. So th what happened in real estate is the, the federal government became very concerned about this idea of these agents working with all these buyers, but actually working for the seller all the time. Now, didn't I give you a phrase last night? that had something to do with an agent who was working with a buyer but working for the seller? Mm -hmm. What did I say it was? Sub-agent Sub of the seller. That's what everybody used to be. Everybody used to be a sub-agent of the seller. So, because of that situation, the federal government put a lot of pressure on real estate boards and commissions around the country and said, you got to eliminate this process. you got to cut down on this process. You either have to stop showing properties that aren't your listings, right? If you only show your listings, it's very clear you represent the seller, right? So you've got to stop showing properties that aren't your listings, or if you show properties to somebody else that aren't your listings, you ought to be representing that buyer, not that seller. That's how buyer agency was born, folks. That's how buyer agency was born. That's where it came from, okay? Does that kind of make sense, how we have evolved a little bit? All right. So single agency is when your firm represents either the buyer or the seller in a transaction. I've already explained to you the difference between buyer agency and seller sub-agency. 
These are both situations where the broker in question, the real estate broker, is working with the buyer. The question, though, is who do they represent? In buyer agency, who do they represent? The buyer. The buyer. In seller sub agency, who do they represent? The seller. They're still working with the buyer, but they actually represent the seller. Is the listing agent a seller sub? Yes. Listing agent is a seller sub agent. Now, one of the unforeseen problems of allowing real estate brokers to represent buyers is what happens when you have a listing, your firm has a listing, and now all of a sudden your firm also represents a buyer who becomes interested in that listing. That's called dual agency. When the firm represents both the buyer and the seller in the same transaction at the same time. Now, if I exclusively represent the seller, what am I supposed to do? Seller's best interest. I'm supposed to do everything I can to make sure the seller gets the best deal possible, right? Mm -hmm. If I exclusively represent the buyer, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to work in the buyer's best interest. Make sure I do everything possible to get the seller the best deal possible. What do you think I'm supposed to do if I'm a dual agent? And please don't tell me, work in their both interest and get both of them the best deal possible. Let me just tell you, that ain't possible. So what am I supposed to do if I'm a dual agent? Carlos said nothing. It's pretty close to the truth, unfortunately. Hunter said, keep your mouth closed. Also, fairly close to the truth. Because here's the thing, folks. You can't hurt your client ever, right? The first rule of representing somebody is to not harm them, right? And there's very little you can do in a transaction that wouldn't harm one or the other, right? Think of it this way. If I go out and show houses and Carlos finds a house he wants to make an offer on, what's the first thing he's going to look to me for for advice? The first piece of advice he's probably going to want from me is what? Price. Is it overpriced? Is it underpriced? Should I offer less price? Should I offer more than less price? I mean, how much can I go under? Should I ask the seller to close the cost? All that's to do with money, right? He wants advice on money from me. Well, if I give him advice on money and I say, well, this is what you should be offering. You should start here and try to negotiate it. If I give him advice and tell him to offer less and less price, haven't I hurt my seller client? Mm -hmm. By the same token, if I take his offer to the seller and I go, listen, you know, he's offered you ten thousand dollars less than this price. I probably wouldn't accept that. I would probably try to get him up a little bit from that. Haven't I hurt Carlos? Mm -hmm. So which one can I give pricing advice to? Mm -hmm. Neither of them. Neither one. It doesn't end there. Let's say we get under contract. Miraculously, without me giving pricing advice, we've gotten con Carlos under contract with Dusty, who's the seller in this deal. Now, Carlos is a first-time home buyer. He's going to have some questions about this process, right? Tell me some questions he might have when we're going to contract. Do I need to get an inspection? Do I need, should I get a home inspection? You think the client's going to ever ask you that question? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, let's think about that question. What's the answer that if I was only representing Carlos, what answer would I give? Yes. Absolutely. If I'm only representing Dusty and a buyer asked me if they should get a home inspection, what answer should I give? Use your you best don't need that. Use your best judgment. Not a big deal. Well, but if I'm a dual agent, what do I say? Yes. I have a question. What was your answer earlier? Say nothing. That's what I can do. Right? And I'm going to get to your question. I promise. Okay. Because no matter how I answer the question, I've hurt one of them, right? If I tell him, yes, you should get an inspection, Dusty's like, dude, why are you going to have this guy in here for four hours pulling my house apart, finding all this crap that's wrong with it that I don't want them to know, right? If I thought we owe honesty. We do owe honesty. 
<laughs> Diane said, if I don't know it, I can't tell it. I didn't say that. Diane said it, right? Y'all heard that. Tamara, you heard that. Diane said it, not me. But isn't that going to be the reaction that Dusty would have? Be like, how did you tell him he needs an inspection, man? I thought you were working for me, right? Now, if I don't tell him he needs an inspection, Carlos is going to be like, um, don't you think I should be getting an inspection? I'm like, well, you really have to decide that's in your best interest. And if you think it is, then you probably should get one. That's the best non-answer answer in the world, right? And he's gonna be, and Carlos is going to be like, this dude, man, I, I, I can't believe anything he says. He tap dances around everything. Because you know why? You know why he feels like I'm tap dancing around everything? Because I am. Because I am. And every single thing that comes up over the course of that transaction, I promise I'm coming back. Okay. Every single thing that comes up over the course of that transaction is going to be just like that. Should I do this? Well, where have you been? When he gets the inspection report back, we're going to have 46 things that are wrong with the house. Which one should I ask the seller to fix? I can't answer that question, right? Whichever ones you think you should ask the seller to fix. And then when you ask, and I go to Dusty, and Dusty's like, well, which ones of these are reasonable to fix? I'm like, which ones do you think are reasonable to fix? I answer every question with a question, right? This is the best agent in the world. All the while. So, Carlos said, what do I do when I'm a dual agent? What did he say? Nothing. What am I going to get paid for just doing nothing? Double, because I'm both the listing agent and I am the buyer's agent. What a great business plan, right? Do nothing and get paid double. Except here's the thing. What are we supposed to do first and foremost? Represent our clients. Are we really representing anybody in that situation? No. Yourself. Yourself. Your own best interest, right? So what was your question, Hunter? I'm sorry. Okay. So we both work for this firm. Why can't we be separate? We're getting there. You represent the seller. We're getting there. I know that's designated, but... We're getting there. Okay. Let, 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 so we're getting there. Okay. All right. So... In this situation, though, it's an inherent conflict of interest. Here's my problem with it. And here's why I'm going to tell you what the Real Estate Commission's perspective on it. The Real Estate Commission will never tell you you shouldn't do dual agency. Because, folks, there are going to be times when it's inevitable that you're in a dual agency transaction. I'll give you an example of an inevitable dual agency situation. You have been, Isaiah hired me three months ago as a buyer's agent. And we have looked and looked and looked and looked and found nothing for him. Right? Meanwhile, Jesse hires me as a listing agent to list her property in Garner. Now, Isaiah has been looking in, inside the Beltline Raleigh for three months. Jesse lists his property in Garner with me. And I go take all the pictures and measure it. And we get everything. We get it and put it on the market. And the day after I put it on the market, I get an email from Isaiah. And be like, you know... I'm getting sick of not finding anything in Raleigh. I started looking around in Garner, and I saw this house that just came on the market, and it looks pretty sweet. I want to take a look at it. And guess which one it is? Your, your listing. It's my listing. Now, do I have a buyer agency agreement with Isaiah? Yeah. My, does my firm have a buyer agency agreement with him? Yes. Does my firm have a listing agreement with Jesse? Yes. Can we avoid dual agency in that transaction? No. no. It is completely unavoidable there. And that's why it's still legal. But here's what the Real Estate Commission's perspective on it is. That's the only time it should really happen, is when it's unavoidable. The problem with dual agency is agents seek it out. Why do they seek it out? They get paid double. But double the money comes with about 100 times the liability. I'm going to just be real honest with you. Yeah, because you'd be tempted to just close the deal. You'd be like, oh, yeah, this, uh, you don't need a home inspection. We'll just get it done. Absolutely. And so let's just play that train out. You're tempted to say, yeah, you don't need a home inspection. God, it's just $450. You're going to throw it out in the toilet. It's wasted. You'll never get it back. I mean, anything they find is going to cost $50 to fix. So you just paid somebody $450 to find something that costs, so they can come in there and say, you need to put a receptacle cover on. 
and that. So they don't get a home inspection. And six months later, he finds out he's got cracks in the foundation and settlement problems that are going to cost $25,000 to fix. Who's he going to sue? You. Me and my firm. And is he going to win? Yes. You better believe it. You better believe it. The liability in those transactions is huge, folks. Absolutely huge. And here's the other thing. The Real Estate Commission, when they find out you were in a dual agency transaction, if they get a complaint about you in a dual agency transaction, they, they don't say, okay, did this agent make a mistake? They say, where did this agent make a mistake? There's a difference there, right? They start with the assumption that you screwed it up. And you know why? Because the likelihood is almost 100% that you did screw it up somewhere along the way. Let me give you another example in my Carlos and Dusty situation. Dusty's got his house listed at 250. He listed it at 250. Now, when he listed it, you think we probably had a conversation about what number he would really take? Right? You know, like, we want to try it at 250. You know, I don't want to go lower than 245, but if push came to shove, I would take 240. Is that a realistic conversation to have when you list your home with the real estate broker? Yeah. Now, so I, I know that. I can't unknow that information, right? Now, Carlos is looking at this thing, and he makes an offer, and he offers 230. Now, he asked me, he's like, what should I offer? And I said, look, Carlos, I can't tell you because I also represent the seller. Remember that whole dual agency thing I told you about? I can't, and I'm trying to do it the right way, right? I can't, I can't give you any pricing advice. Um, I'll present them whatever you want me to present them. He's like, well, look, I'm going to write it up at 230, um, but if I had to, I'd go 240 on it. All right, so now what do I know from Dusty? Oh, yeah. He'll do 240. What do I know from Carlos? He'll do 240. What do I have to present to Dusty? 230. Now, can I present to Dusty 230, but he says he'll do 240? No, because that would be harming your negotiating position, right? So I've got to sit there and chew my lip off my face while I present 230. Meanwhile, Dusty gets all mad. He's like, he's guy ain't even serious about buying my house. I'm Twenty thousand dollars below list price, man. I can't deal with this guy. I just, I, I ain't gonna make a counter offer. Don't even worry about it, folks. <laughs> you you charging six percent on this thing, right? What's six percent of two hundred forty thousand dollars? Fourteen. Yeah, about fifteen grand, almost fifteen thousand dollars, right? And who would keep all of that fifteen thousand dollars? Me and the firm, right? Because we don't have any buyer's agent to split it with, right? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be real hard for you to get up from that table with Dusty without just casually mentioning? Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, I really kind of think if you went back to 240, this guy might take it. Right there, you were guilty of a license law violation. The temptation is incredible in dual agency transactions. For that reason alone, you should be very leery of them. Does that make sense for everybody? I'm not saying don't do one or you'll never do one because there's going to come a time when you won't have a choice. I'm saying save that risky thing for when you have to. That's something to seek out because the extra money in that one transaction is not worth the worrying about it later on down the road. It's just not. I assure you. Um, so, with this dual agency thing, remember it's the firm who represents both the buyers and the sellers in the same transaction at the same time. Now, Hunter brought up a really good question, and I want to work on her question here now. She said, well, what if we both work for the same firm? Now, let's use this room as an example. Let's say this is a sale committee. Assume you all work for Pan Realty. I'm the broker in charge of Pan Realty, and you all work here for me. Okay? We're having a sales meeting. So if if Jesse takes a new listing, raise your hand if you represent that seller. Every one of you should have your hand up, right? Because every broker within the firm represents that seller. Megan represents a buyer client. Raise your hand if you represent that buyer client. Every single one of us, because every broker in the firm represents her client as well. Now, Megan's buyer becomes interested in Jesse's listing. Raise your hand if you're now a dual agent in that transaction. Every single one of us 
just became a dual agent because we all have a responsibility equally now to the buyer and the seller. That's Here's the thing. Megan and Jesse just met each other. They didn't even know each other before this sales meeting. They've never worked together. They don't know anything about each other's clients. Megan, you represent her seller. Do you know even who her seller is? Do you know what they'd be willing to sell for? Why they want to sell? you know anything about it? No. Jesse, you know anything about her client, the buyer? No. Is it fair to you, really, to all of a sudden, and by the way, this buyer is your mama. So now you equally represent this buyer client, your mother, and this seller client that you've never met. That's a tough damn position, isn't it? And it becomes an unrealistic position. And that right there is why, and I'm going to back up to those slides, don't worry about it. That right there is why we have this thing called designated dual agency. Designated dual agency. Now, what's the last two words? Dual agency. Dual agency. So still we've got the firm representing both the buyer and the seller at the same time, right? Here's the difference. Now, when that situation comes up, remember we're all in this sales meeting, we all work for the same firm, I'm informed as the broker in charge that this thing has happened. Megan comes up to me before the meeting and she goes, Travis, I just wanted to let you know, I don't know that Jesse girl over there, but um, she's got a listing and my mom, who I'm representing, is interested in that listing. You know what I'm going to look at Megan and say? I'm say, Megan, do you know anything about Jesse's seller? What are you going to say? No. And then I'm going to say, Megan, I tell you what, you represent your mom and only your mom. You have no more responsibility to that seller. And I'm going to walk over to Jesse. I'm going to say, Jesse, do you know anything about Megan or her mom, buyer client? Or do you know anything about her buyer client? Because she's got a client that's interested in one of your listings. And you're going to say, what? No. And I'm going to say, Jesse, won't you do this? You represent your seller and only your seller, and you have no more responsibility to that buyer. Ma'am. Before we had that conversation, how many of us in the room represented the buyer? All of us. How many of us in the room represented the seller? Everybody. Now, how many of us at this point represent the buyer? Two. Megan. And only Megan. How many of us represent the seller? Jesse. And only Jesse. That's what designated dual agency does. It takes these two brokers and essentially says, y'all be separate for this one transaction. You peel off from the whole firm. Nobody else is representing your client in this transaction. Now, your client's got to agree to that, right? So, you're, so what is your client giving up in this designated dual agency? What they're giving up is the rest of this group of people, right? But let me ask you a question. When Jesse Seller hired PN Realty, who did they really think they were hiring in the first place? Jesse. Jesse. Who did they expect to be working with? Jesse. Do they expect to be working with Quinn? No. It, and they probably don't expect to work with anybody then, right? They'd probably be like, oh, i got to go find a new agent, right? Their perception is they work with that one person. Your mom, what's her perception? She's going to work with who? You and all of you. So has anything really changed for them from their perspective? No. Nothing. Now, can Jesse give her seller all the advice in the world, like pricing and inspections and repairs that she normally would want to give? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can Megan give her buyer all the advice in the world, pricing and inspections and whatever else that she would normally give? Mm -hmm. Yes. So can Megan work in the best interest of her client? Yes. yes. Can Jesse work in the best interest of her client? Can the rest of us sit back and kick our feet up and not care about it? Yes. That, folks, is designated dual agency. Yes, ma'am. So what happens if Jesse and Megan didn't know each other? So that's a good question. What happens if the if the brokers know each other? Right. All right. So let me ask it, let me answer that part and then I'll let you ask answer the second part if there is one. Okay. The brokers knowing each other is not a problem. 
I was just using that to demonstrate how isolated they really were and how ridiculous it was that supposedly they both represent the same people, right? They could very well be friends. They could know each other. They could know each other socially. The key here is, does Megan know anything about Jesse's client? Yeah, does right. Jesse know anything about Megan's client? Now, if the answer to those questions is no, then we can designate. So now go ahead and ask your second part. So, and if, if, if Jesse knew how much, if Jesse knew about Megan's mom before she picked up his list, yep. and knew how much her mom was going to pay. pay. Could they be designated agents? Yeah. No. No. And that's up to me as the broker in charge to determine. Because I'm the one doing the designating, right? I'm the one doing the choosing and saying, Megan, you work with this client. Jesse, you work with this client. So I've got to find out, do we already have that personal confidential information that's been shared, right? And if we do, if Megan's client know something about Jesse's client or the other way around, or Jesse knows something about Megan's client, in that case, we can't do this designated dual agency, so we're right back at true dual agency, where neither one of them can give advice to their clients. So, so then, can you appoint somebody else? In theory, yes. In theory, yes, I could appoint somebody else. But remember, I'd probably have to sit down with the client and ask the client if they were comfortable with that situation. I'd have to talk to the brokers. Because in that situation, I'm pretty sure that person I appoint is not going to work for free. So somebody's going to have to be splitting some money up Show somewhere money. along the way. Money. Right? <laughs> so it's going to be, you know, we'd have to work that out. But yes, in theory, I could designate two entirely different agents. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why we have this designated agency thing? Now, Hunter, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we do it. So here's the thing, folks. I, I tell you, be very careful not to practice dual agency. I got no problem with you practicing designated dual agency. Because in all honesty, designated dual agency is pretty much the same as single agency from your client's perspective. And that's the perspective we care about here, right? It's the client's perspective. They don't really care that the broker in charge is having to tell Megan to work with Megan's client and Jesse to work with Jesse's client because that's their perspective anyway. Is that it's those people who they're working with. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me back up a couple of slides here to some of the rules for dual agency. First of all, it must be disclosed. You cannot do this thing without permission, without written permission. Now, let me point out here, when I say you can't practice dual agency without written permission, practicing dual agency means actually making offers and going under contract, okay? Do you think you can show a property that would create a dual agency situation if you don't have the written permission of both clients? The answer is yes. What kind of permission do you think you have to get? Oral permission. So you're allowed to get oral permission for a limited amount of time. And there's a certain time at which you must put it in writing. What time did I say that always is? The time you present an offer. So if you got this limited time permission for dual agency, here's how that would happen. You sit, Megan sits down with her mom, fills out a buyer agency agreement. Because as crazy as it sounds, she's still got to have a buyer agency agreement, right? Because she knows her mom's going to make an offer. So she does it ahead of time, and she gets to this line on the on the buyer agency agreement that deals with dual agency, because the client has to authorize dual agency, and they have choices here. They can say, yes, the firm can be a dual agent, or no, the firm cannot be a dual agent. And she's like, I'm never going to represent a seller against my mom, so we'll just check this box, you know. The firm can only be an exclusive agent. They can't participate in dual agency. And she goes and she shows her mom all these houses and it works great. And then mom wants to look at this new listing that Jesse just put on the market. And Megan drives up to the house and she gets out of the car and she doesn't recognize Jesse's name, but she does recognize that sign sitting in the front yard. And she's like, uh oh, 
That's my office. Right? So now, does the firm represent the buyer? Does the firm represent the seller? If she shows her that house, is that not potentially dual agency? And we can't do that without what? Permission of some kind. Now, does she have to be carrying the damn agency agreement in her back pocket and pull it out and get written permission right then and there to show the thing? What can she do? She can say, Mom, back when we did the agency agreement, when you hired my firm, I said I was going to only represent you. This listing, and I didn't realize it until just now when we pulled up in front of the house, is actually listed by my firm. So is it all right with you to show it to you, understanding that this is one of my firm's listings, and if, I, if you did make an offer on it, it would be a dual agency situation. That's what you would have to do. You'd have to get their oral permission to show that property. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can get limited time oral permission. Would you have to eventually put that in writing? Mm -hmm. If what? Mm -hmm. If they want to make an offer. Do you need to put it in writing if they say, oh, I, don't, I hate this house? No, no. no you, don't, you don't need to go back and do it at that point. Why? So then at that point, she has to call Jesse up and tell her to call, or can she call the seller? She can't call the seller. I guess she could technically, but she probably doesn't have contact information to call the seller. We would hope that the seller's already given their written permission, and there's another life lesson in there. If you're going to put stuff in the MLS and you're in a big firm where there are a lot of buyer's agents, you probably ought to go ahead and get the seller's permission for dual agency up front. Because eventually, some agent from your firm is going to want to show that thing. And you don't want to be having to track down the seller on a case-by-case -case basis. Does that make sense? So you're probably going, in fact, most firms have a firm policy that the sellers will authorize dual agency on the listing agreement. Most firms do. And how do you explain that? Uh, what I say to the seller is, you know, this only would be if necessary. Most likely the buyer is going to come from another firm, which would not be dual agency. But there are 50 other agents in my office, and if you don't authorize this dual agency, you're saying that all the buyer clients represented by those 50 agents cannot come look at your property. Legally, they can't look if you don't authorize this dual agency. And most sellers at that point are going to say, well, I don't want to keep a bunch of buyers away, so they sign the line, right? And it is true. It's a very true thing to represent them to them that way. Now, the way I would explain it, I would go on to say, but if that does happen, it would be another agent in my firm, and that agent would represent their client that they were working with, and I would still be representing you, and I would work to get you the best deal possible. What form of dual agency am I explaining to them now? Designated dual agency. When I say, if that happened, that person, that agent who was working with the buyer, they would be working with that buyer, and I wouldn't have anything to do with it, but I would still be on your side, and I would be giving you all the advice and working in your corner. What I'm explaining to them at that point is designated dual agency. Does that make sense? Okay. Also, it's very important to remember that just because they've given their permission in advance doesn't mean you don't have to tell them on a case-by-case -case basis when this thing happens. You know, and here's what I mean by that. You get an offer in, and it's from somebody who's represented by your firm. You need to tell the seller, hey, first thing I need to let you know is this offer comes from somebody who's represented by our firm. I know you authorize that, but you should know that this person is represented by our firm. You still need to tell them on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay? Disclose, disclose, disclose. Don't ever do undisclosed dual agency. Very bad. Okay? Everybody okay on this? We do want, if we're going to do dual agency, to have disclosed dual agency. It's intentionally created, and we have the informed consent of both parties, which must be written prior to presentation of first offer. Informed consent means you've told them all the bad things about dual agency and they feel that the benefits outweigh the disadvantages. Now, here's something that's important that I need to point out to you. If I'm telling them the bad things about dual agency, I'm probably explaining things like, well, if it was dual, if it was true dual agency where I had a buyer who was interested, you know, and I was also representing you, 
I couldn't give you any advice on pricing. That's a pretty bad thing, right? So you're going to tell them all that bad stuff. You're going to tell them, I can't give you this. If you are, here's what you're authorizing. You're saying I can't give you this advice. But the reason you would authorize this is because there are a lot of other agents in my firm who have a lot of buyer clients, and you probably don't want to freeze them out of looking at your property, right? So they have to feel that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. The other thing that's important to explain to them is we're not automatically in dual agency. Just because you authorize it now doesn't mean you're saying I will never give you pricing advice. We're saying that if it comes up that a buyer represented by our firm makes an offer, then I can't give you pricing advice. What if we get offers from other firms? What am I at that point? Am I a dual agent? I'm an exclusive agent, single agent, exclusive agent. So dual agency is an if necessary thing. Even when they authorize it in advance, we're not dual agents right from the get-go. We're single agents until dual agency happens. And dual agency happens when a buyer that's represented by the same firm makes an offer. Everybody got that? Very important. In general terms, can you explain the difference between disclosed and designated? So disclosed just means they know about it. They know what's going on. Whereas designated is a form of dual agency. Okay? So disclosed dual agency just means the correct kind of dual agency. You could have disclosed true dual agency or disclosed designated dual agency. Disclosed would be the, the flip side of the coin when you're talking about somebody who's in a dual agency situation and they have no idea. So here's what undisclosed dual agency would look like. I have your house listed. You've listed your house with me and my firm. I bring you an offer. I don't tell you that that offer comes from a client that I also represent as a buyer client. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there giving you advice, right? And I'm also giving them advice. I'm working both sides of the thing, right? And I never tell either party that I represent the other party. So you never question my motivations. You never say, well, what are you telling me? Are you telling me this? What are you telling them? Because you have no idea. That's undisclosed dual agency. Whereas disclosed dual agency would be me saying, Jeff, I've got an offer for you, but I can't give you any advice about that offer because I also represent the buyer who's making this offer. So you're going to be on your own about deciding how you want to counter offer. Trust me, I'm telling them the exact same thing. That would be disclosed dual agency. Okay. Now, designated dual agency is a form of disclosed dual agency. So disclosed is legal dual agency, undisclosed is illegal dual agency. Mm -hmm. So once you get into legal dual agency, we've disclosed it, we've gotten their permission, there's two different kinds. True dual agency, where every broker in the firm represents the buyer, and every broker in the firm represents the seller. Okay, we got that? Mm -hmm. And designated dual agency, where the broker in charge is basically singling out one broker to represent the buyer, one broker to represent the seller. And once you go into that designated dual agency, those two people just basically treat each other like they work in different firms. They don't share any information that they wouldn't share with an agent from another firm. They don't share any personal confidential information about the transaction. They work with each other, but in the way that they would somebody who worked for another company. Because now they can really work for their client. As a broker in charge, is that ideal because the firm gets the whole commission? Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's the blunt truth. Of, I mean, best case scenario for a broker in charge and for a firm from a profit bottom line perspective is designated dual agency because it doesn't have the liability of true dual agency, but the firm still keeps all the commission in house. I mean, it's not going to one individual broker, it's going, it's being split between two brokers, but you know, it's all coming in the firm, and of course the firm's going to get a split of everybody's money. So, yes, that absolutely is the best case scenario for the firm. So are those the first houses you got to show? No. Oh. You know, I, I, I hear that, and I think it could conceivably happen, but here's the thing. 20 years ago, would, would, would that have happened more often? Yeah, because 20 years ago, your clients relied on you completely for what they saw. Now, my clients know what the hell's on the market before I do. 
Like they're emailing me, oh, I just saw this listing come on the market, and blah, 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 when, when we see it. Because I've got them set up on 14 automated searches, and you know, it's just, it's going to them as soon as it hits. I don't see it before they do. Somebody puts it in the MLS, I've got them set up on an automated search. They get an email. I don't even have myself set up on an email because I don't need to be because I know they'll let me know if they want to see it. So it's really hard, you know, in, in today's world, it would be hard to pick and choose what you're showing somebody in that manner because they're seeing everything already. That, I mean, that's the kind of, you know, just uh, um, best response I can think of given the situation. Yes, the motivation is certainly there. But here's the thing. In designated agency, the motivation is not really there for the broker. They don't care that it's designated agency because they're getting paid one side of the transaction just like they normally would, right? Yeah, the broker in charge may be sitting over there rooting for designated agency, but the, the agents don't. They don't care. And honestly, I don't care either. I really don't. As long as we got happy clients, I don't care if it's you know in house or out of house or however. Sell it. That's all I care. All right? Is everybody okay on the, the, the form of dual agency here? Okay. As I said, talking about designated agency and sort of wrapping that idea up, putting a photo on it. You cannot be a designated agent if you already have that confidential information. You know, if you already know something about the clients that you shouldn't know, <coughs> the client on the other side of the transaction. Like for example, here's an example. I'm going back to Jesse and, and, and Megan. You know, we go back to the same example. Megan likes to talk. She's a chatterbox, right? You are running into those in real estate. There's going to be that one agent in your office, you know their clients better than they know their clients because they talk about them all the time, right? And Megan is one of those agents. She's in the office, she's like, my mom is driving me crazy trying to help her find a house. I can't find anything to suit her, you know, and the problem is her price point. You know, she can pay $300,000 cash because she got in the bank because she just got a divorce settlement from my stepdad, who I hate. You know, but she wants to look at things that are two twenty-five. dollars well, Jessie's sitting there doing her work, and she overhears all this, right? And now, Jessie's got a listing that Megan's mom is interested in. Wouldn't that be compromising information that if the seller were to find out that her mom could afford up to this amount because she's got it? It would hurt your mom for the seller to know that information, right? So at that point in time, there's no way that Jessie... To be designated against your mom. It couldn't happen because you've been poisoned already with, by that information. So if your firm practice is designated a dual agency, really you should have a policy about don't talk about your clients in the office. You can talk about your listings, you know. You can say, oh, I've got a great listing, it's this price, it's in a great neighborhood, blah, 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 blah. But don't talk about, yeah, and they need to sell it because they got to pay tuition at Duke next semester for their kid. Right? So that brings me to my golden rule of real estate. In this business, if you want to stay out of trouble, you talk about property, not people. That will keep you out of trouble 95% of the time. Talk about property, not people. It's much easier said than done, though. Because it's the people that drive you crazy. And that's what you want to talk about. But if you constantly remind yourself, talk about property, not people. Jesse might want to walk in and say, look, y'all, I'm going to show this listing I just put on the market. Man, it is priced. It's unbelievable price. These people have got to sell it because they got to pay tuition next year at Duke. Well, see, right there, she just poisoned everybody in the office. We can't be designated agents, right? Because we all know something that would compromise that seller. But she could say the same thing, the same me What's the message she's trying to get through? Need to sell it and what? Good price. That's the message she's trying to get through. Can't she just say that? She could come in the same salesman and be like, look, y'all got to go show this list I just put on the market. It's priced at $225, and I'm telling you, you look at the comps around, and it just blows everything out of the water. Now, has she done anything to damage our ability to do designated agency there? No. no. And she conveyed the same message. And that's what I mean about you just have to be careful about what you say. You just have to be careful, okay? Talk about property, not people. Now, do you think the broker in charge, me, can I be a designated agent? 
Can I designate myself to work against Ford? Yeah. Right. See, y'all are only fair because y'all have taken the class. <laughs> and the, the answer to that question is yes. As long as Ford is not what? A provisional broker. If Ford is a full broker, then I can designate myself against one of my own brokers in my firm. Wouldn't you designate yourself all the time? Well, no, not if I wanted to keep my agents. I would only designate myself when it's my transaction. I mean, how, how long am I going to keep Megan if she comes to me and says, well, you know, my mom's interested in one of Jesse's listings. I'd be like, you know what? I can fix that. I'll represent your mom and only your mom. You go home and don't get paid. And then you see what I'm saying? I'm like, it ain't going to work as a broker in charge. But if they long. call you or the firm, if they call the firm asking. If they call the firm asking, you mean like call on the telephone? Yeah. Number one, that don't happen anymore. Like, people do not call on the telephone anymore. It really? Just, like, if, like, I, if I had no idea of what I was looking for, I would probably call email. Yeah, you would go on Realtor.com, Zillow, Trulia, yeah, true. blah, 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 yeah. blah. And you would click on one of those buttons up there where it says, ask a question. And you'd get an email well, and a phone call from an agent. Suffered. Nobody called Zillow anymore. Yeah. This past Oh, yeah. Zillow's the word. Don't, don't go on Zillow. Don't feed that monster. If you go on this, stop. I think it's the easiest Just, one to do. It is. And nothing on there is accurate. <laughs> nothing. You may as well be going to the drunk crackhead on the corner and asking him how much that house is listed for because you will get better information from that guy. I promise. It's that bad. Zillow will show you things that sold four months ago mm -hmm. as active. And once you get your license, you're going to learn to hate it. You know why? Because you can get phone calls from your clients. They will call about this and be like, well, uh, you showed us those houses on Saturday, but I found this one. It's a whole lot better than what you've been showing us. And you're like, wow, I'm surprised I missed something. And, uh, well, I'm sending you an email right now. And you pull out your phone and you look at it. And you're like, this damn thing closed six months ago. I know because I sold it. But guess what Zillow's still showing it as? Active. And it ain't by mistake, folks. Because guess what? Closed listings don't get any clicks. Guess how they make their money? Clicks. And selling those clicks. So they intentionally misrepresent stuff all the time. That's fine. How about Realtor.com? Realtor.com comes from us. I mean, I, look, I don't like the Association of Realtors. I'm very blunt about that because it's the biggest money-making hog in the world. And you don't have a choice about it, you know? If, if you want to be a residential broker, you're going to pay them their money, right? But Realtor.com comes directly from the MLS, and they do not change the data. Here's another thing Trulia and Zillow do, do that you'll love. Trulia rounds up the bathrooms. So you put it in the MLS, it's two and a half. Guess what they show it as? Three. <laughs> and so here's what will happen. You get a phone call. Oh, I would love to see this house, blah, 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 blah. And you take them out and show it to them, and then they get mad because it's got two and a half bathrooms. I thought it had three. Where'd you find that out? So you know what? Anytime I have somebody who calls me and says they want to see a house, first thing I do is email them the real listing sheet from the MLS and say, look this over and see if you still want to see it. Don't believe wherever you've seen it anywhere else unless you saw it on Realtor.com. Because Realtor.com is the only one that doesn't change the information in some way. And especially rentals. God, if you put a rental on the MLS, that thing will be showing active for three more years. Don't you put, okay, so on Zillow, if you're a realtor, you, like, claim a house. Yes. Okay. And then, like, I'm on the seller side. Yep. The buyer side. Okay, that's what I thought. Yep. So, you don't put it up there. Nope. Okay. They pull it automatically from the MLS when you load it up. Okay. But they have, if you look at their terms of service, it says they have the right to modify that information. Yeah. And what will happen is you'll inevitably find something wrong with that information. Yeah. So, like, for example, Zillow, one of their big ones. One of the rules we haven't talked about yet in North Carolina is you must measure the property yourself or hire a licensed appraiser to do it. If you're going to stake the square footage, you're responsible for measuring it yourself or hire a licensed appraiser. You go out and you measure the thing, it measures 2,150 square feet. Now, the tax records are just wrong. The tax records show 2,500 square feet, right? Guess what Zillow does? They pull it from the tax records. They don't pull the number that you put in the MLS, that you took the time to measure it and draw the thing out. They pull it from the tax records. And they stick it up there as 2,500 square feet. And then you have somebody calling and screaming at you because they went and looked at the house. 
because they thought it was 2,500 square feet and come to find out it's 2,100. And how can you do that? You commit fraud and they're going to file a complaint with you against the, the real estate commission. And the real estate commission is going to go, oh, still on. And they're not, and, and it's not going to be a big deal. You're not going to get in trouble, but you're going to have to deal with that headache. So don't feed that monster. Just stop. Stop going there. Stop sending people there. Stop. Just stop. You, you will thank me later. Trust me. The sooner we choke them out, the better. I didn't say that. I mean it. I really do. If they were accurate, they'd be great. And they do have great tools. I mean, some of the stuff on, now that, that estimator on Zillow, I don't know where that number comes from. That's amazing. God, I, that thing. I mean, I, I have never seen numbers be so, you may as well just, I don't know, get a three-year-old to pick a number out of a hat and you have a better estimate. It's unreal where those numbers come from. <laughs> All right, so yes, a broker in charge can be designated as long as they're not designated against a provisional broker. Break time.